Okay, cool. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from everyone. Um, we're going to present ESO for the next two hours. ESO stands for Efficient, Accurate, Scalable Eukaryotic Models. Uh, it's a tool for the improvement of eukaryotic genome annotation. Uh, the tool was developed by Cynthia Webster, and I'll be introducing the tool and then giving it off to Cynthia. Okay, so um, for the next two hours, we're just going to introduce genome annotation and introduce the ESO annotation pipeline. And then Cynthia will take you through running ESO, and then we'll have a break for five minutes, and then we'll get into annotating Drosophila with ESO. So um, genome assembly is just the start. And over the past 20 years, we've seen a rapid growth of sequencing efforts, along with improved contiguity of genome assembly and the emergence of long read <clears throat> technology. And so you can see that there is like a positive trend of the availability of genome assemblies. You can also see that uh, due to the emergence of long read technologies, assemblies also have long, um, higher contiguities. Um, so although there's like this boom of genome assemblies, it's just the start. So um, genome annotation remains to be a severe bottleneck in the pipeline. And um, essentially, this is what you get after um, assembling a genome. Uh, you have lines and lines of APGCs, but what does it really mean? That's when genome annotation comes into play. Um, so genome annotation basically includes structural and func functional uh, annotation. And it's basically trying to uh, identify protein protein antigens. So when we talk about uh, structural annotation, you're basically trying to identify the locations of exons and introns, as well as the splice sites. Yeah. And essentially, after you um, do structural annotation, you end up with a general feature format file or a GFF file which has your, um, your contact uh, number or your chromosome number, the tool that you use for the structural annotation, as well as the gene feature, which is a gene transcript start or stop codon, as well as introns and coding sequences. You also have um, coordinates of where these regions are in the genome. Um, function annotation, on the other hand, is um, you're basically relating this to what this uh, what a gene is coding for. So um, uh, the genome browser is giving you a view of how what the gene region looks like and what it's potentially um, uh, uh, coding for. Nice. <laughs> okay, so um, if you would notice here, you have like the BLAST and gene ontology terms, which are basically giving you the description of what the gene is coding for. And the gene ontology gives you the uh, overall umbrella term of what this function comes under. So um, genome uh, annotation is basically identifying the location of genes and all the coding regions in a genome, as well as attaching biological meaning to them. So you start off with a soft mass genome. Um, you use a tool to get uh, the structure addition, basically trying to identify the location of the gene in its um, in the genome, and then you're finally attaching a functional annotation to this region. Oh yeah, so many tools provide a structure or a functional annotation, but few provide both of these um, features. So there are many challenges in annotating a eukaryotic genome. And the problem is that many assembled genomes lack a high quality annotation. Um, the true positives are low in number and that leads to a low sensitivity. And when you have a high number of false positives, there's a lower precision in your genome. Um, so model organisms are mostly measured with a score called an F1, which is a harmonic mean between your precision and sensitivity. But non-models do not have this a score to benchmark the quality of its annotation. So essentially, we don't have the answer, so there's no way to know. 
And so um, the goal for our first uh, paper was to comprehensively assess existing tools for genome manipulation in model and non-models and determine the best practices and methods to evaluate them. Um, you can read more about the methods and how we went about this in our paper, Welcome to the Big Leaves. Um, but essentially, we focused on plant genomes in this paper, and plant genomes are especially difficult to annotate. They're very complex due to the increased presence of transposable elements and repeat, uh, repeat elements. They also are known for polyploidy and are known for their large genome sizes. So in our paper, we used five plant species. Um, Leodendron, Rosa, and Funeria are our non-model genomes, as, and Arabidopsis thaliana and Populus are our model species. Um, they also have varying repeat contents, with Leodendron having the highest amount of repeat, but also having the highest genome size in our test sample. So essentially what we did was we benchmarked softwares and different inputs to these softwares. And what we did was we compared softwares that use machine learning models that are Breaker, Zebra, and Maker to um, tools that do not have non-machine learning models like straight type. We also assessed varying um, combinations of input reads. So for example, we, we used a mix of only using short read RNAs and we also used Long read RNAs, we used a combination of short and long read RNAs, as well as proteins. Um, so as I said before, non-models do not have an F1 score, so we can't really benchmark them. But how do we truly evaluate a genome annotation if we don't have this F1 score? Um, Busco score is known uh, to be used as a um, measure of completeness. And we use this to assess how complete the annotation is. Um, we also introduced a new metric, the mono to multi ratio, which is essentially a ratio between the mono exonic and multi exonic genes within an annotation. And then we also try to assess quality with a reciprocal, reciprocal blast, which is um, essentially through a tool that we developed called NTAP. And that is to assess what percentage of predicted genes have a sequence similarity hit. So um, one of the first questions we um, uh, discussed about was whether machine learning is necessary. And um, just to reiterate, we compared Breaker, Zebra, and Maker, which have machine learning, and same time, which did not. And as you can see with the boost score scores, um, the machine learning tools did perform much better than that of string, to string type. And um, deeper sampling is also required for applicants that only use RNA. So um, in all, yes, machine learning is necessary to be able to capture most of the gene models in an annotation. But what is the best combination of input? Yeah, so what we assessed in our paper was that short read uh, RNA inputs are probably the best, uh, are the ones that give us the best quality annotations. Um, so we got the highest boost cost code and annotation rates and the most consistent uh, monomalty ratios when we use short reads as our input. Um, we did see that there was an increase in boost cost score with the inclus inclusion of proteins, but they also captured um, more false positives. Um, so we also uh, ended up understanding that a significant amount of downstream post-processing and filtering was required to generate high quality annotations. Okay, so now it's over to Cynthia. Uh, let me just check the chat. Or not. <laughs> Somebody's asked if they can have a link to the paper. Uh, I'm assuming I can just put that in. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, um, I'm going to continue on. Again, my name is Cynthia Webster, and we're going to talk about ways to improve eukaryotic genome annotation with the development of a tool called Easel. Um, don't Google Easel because you'll just see a lot of easels, but <laughs> our tool is great. Um, because it leverages machine learning, RNA folding, and functional annotations 
in order to enhance gene prediction accuracy. So it's really tying together structural and functional annotation into one pipeline. You may have noticed that Nextflow was presenting a session this week. Um, Easel is actually wrapped in Nextflow and it's very user-friendly um, way to create a single workflow. I believe we have a GitLab link somewhere, but in case it's not in the Discord, if you look up through the QR code or this link, you can find our page, the repository, and the general documentation for Easel as it stands. And we can go through that together. So the next set of slides is going to be explaining this pipeline. All right. So it looks like a lot, but if you break it down, it can be split into four parts. The first being evidence generation, gene prediction, feature filtering, and then evaluation. Um, so these four core steps are what make the pipeline function, but how do you run it? So let's start with how you would install dependencies. Now keep in mind, I said no to the Git pod, but if you have a high performance um, computing system or if you have access to a terminal, um, you can download these yourself and you will be able to test Easel later in the slide deck with a test set that comes equipped with it. Okay, so as I said, Nextflow is how I pieced all of my scripts together, essentially. It's a workflow language um, that leverages, often leverages containers or kind of environments or module files, um, and it's great for rep reproducibility. The way it works is instead of having your scripts in a linear set where you do one after the other, Nextflow actually allows you to take your data and it will disperse it across multiple processes and channels so that there is this parallelization happening. Um, and it speeds up the overall pipeline by a lot. And it's also um, equipped with ways to assess the um, CPU and memory usage. And it's just great. You can see it gets quite complicated though, especially like this is easel. Um, this figure looks pretty wild. <laughs> but essentially each green dot is one of the processes. Um, so maybe I'm running um, Maniprot or Augustus, that would be a process. And then the channel is how it's connecting between. Um, you could see there's a lot of connections. The output file for Nextflow, um, the standard out looks something like this. And really the main takeaway here is when you look at the number X of X, one of one is saying this is a single channel, only one input and one output from this. Multiple channels, it is splitting up my inputs into separate um, channels that run in parallel. Again, this really optimizes our performance and makes it really quick to run um, a lot of samples through. And then we also have um, two instances here. So with available resources, um, you will run as much as you possibly can. Um, it might max out, but it will try to leverage whatever you tell it to do. And with that, it'll be able to run multiple processes in parallel. And you can see some processes rely on input from other channels. Um, and that's when you won't see any action um, because it has to wait to finish. And for me, we have a slurm scheduler on our HPC. So it looks something like this if I really put it to the max. So the first um, dependency is of course Nextflow. And I believe you can just to download it uh, by following the directions on their website. You can also create a conda environment or a container for Nextflow itself. Um, you can see I also include Docker and Singularity, and that is because Easel relies entirely on containers. 
So you really don't need to have anything locally installed except for Nextflow and some kind of container software. Um, I typically use Singularity, um, but if someone is trying to run locally on their own computer, which I haven't tested, uh, you should be able to use Docker. And then finally, these GNU packages, I'm assuming it is a Linux system and you will have these included in my script. So if that's not the case, uh, that'll be like some troubleshooting we'll have to work through over Slack probably. All right, so how do we set the parameters for easel? Again, you can check out the GitLab page um, with this QR code and we can follow along together. So I have a set of mandatory parameters. These are required to run easel and if you don't put them, they're go it's going to fail essentially. So we have uh, four paths here. And by paths, I mean it's directed to something locally on your computer. Uh, so what are the paths? Um, the first being short RNA reads. So easel leverages RNA, because as video said, we think it's essential for the best um, gene prediction. Um, but you can put it in two, like three different forms as a path. So the first is your own user reads. And the second is SRA accession. But there's a third that I recently added and it's just a BAM file. Um, now, if you only included the user reads or the SRA accession list, um, then it would go through the RNA alignment stage, such as HiSET2. But if you include your own set of BAM files, it'll bypass that and continue into transcriptome assembly. Finally, uh, genome is most definitely required, but we do ask that it is soft masked. Um, video didn't get into it as much, but there is also in the paper um, a very detailed section on the importance of soft masking. And we think it's important. So, okay. <laughs> so, uh, what does the SRA input look like? Because I just, didn't quite explain that. It will have a list-like format. So each SRR ID is actually a unique RNA library. Um, at the moment, I have it where you can provide either your own SRA accession list, your paired end user reads, or your BAM files. But currently, not all of them will be taken at once. Um, that's definitely doable, and I will update that in the future. Um, so where do you find these SRA accessions? I typically find them on NCBI. Um, you can look up your species of interest. For instance, here I'm looking up Arabidopsis, and you checked paired RNA-seq, and this will be where you get that actual accession from. And from there, you can build that parameter for the SRA, which is just a list. So in this case, I have one library in my list. Now, as I said, genome soft masking is important. I just want to reiterate what soft masking is. So this is our genome, our cartoon genome. Um, you, there are two existing tools from a package, repeat modeler and repeat masker, where it'll take your genome. You'll notice that it's all uppercase A, T, G, C, but once it goes through repeat masker, um, there's now lowercase versions of the nucleic bases. And this is essentially just uh, representing our repeated and low complexity regions. And again, with structural and functional annotation in this pipeline, we're really interested in protein coding genes. Um, and so we want to try to eliminate uh, repetitive content from what's happening. You'll notice uh, some genomes have big ends. Uh, that is not soft mesh genome, it's actually hard mesh genome. It's okay if it's a combination of both, but as long as there is, you see these small um, A, T, Cs, and Gs, it will not kick you out. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the values that are mandatory. And by value, I mean you're just typing in something. So here we have four, we have boost scale lineage, 
taxon order and training set. This is an example with the Arabidopsis once again. Um, and so for taxon and training set, this taxon is actually meant for NTAP functional annotation. Um, I require it because it really speeds up the process. So if you were to choose Arabidopsis, which is the genus, then NTAP would know to try to focus primarily on um, that genus and it saves a lot of time. For the training set, this is more in relation to the machine learning feature filtering aspect of our pipeline. I have developed three different training sets uh, for eukaryotic uh, clades, and this is plant, invertebrate, invertebrate. And obviously for Arabidopsis, I would be interested in using plant. Um, I will explain later why we have these three options and why they are necessary, but for now, just choose what you think best suits your species. And then this Busco lineage in order. So Busco lineage is related to Busco. If you've run it before, you know that you have to pick um, the most closely related lineage or database to your species. Um, in this case, for Arabidopsis, we would choose Embryophyta or Verde plantae. Um, for something like Drosophila, you might choose Arthropoda um, and birds, aves. So you get the gist. For order, um, this is in relation to OrthoDB proteins. OrthoDB proteins, um, if you look on the website, are massive and <laughs> nobody wants to download the entire set. So I have this um, parameter so that it will actually pull a subset of the uh, most closely related clay, or I guess order, it could be family to your species to focus on pulling proteins that are relevant. And that is entirely for Augustus prediction and generating your structural annotation. But again, how do you find the correct values? I have two different text files, which if you go on the GitLab, you will see links to them. There's this important notes section under each um, set of parameters. This is um, Busco lineage. So as you can see again, we have like the birds and then the order is on the left. You would choose from the left. On the right is just the big um, overarching group that holds that all in. All you need to do is just copy and paste this into your script um, under the associated parameter and it should run fine. So if I were to pick one for Arabidopsis, again, I'm looking at this list. I'm gonna go with Verde Plenty this time before I could have done Embryophyta. It does not matter which one you choose as long as it's relevant to your species. For order, this is directly associated with Arabidopsis. So I'm going to pick it. It's going to best capture um, the genes in my species. If you didn't have anything closely related to your species, you might go more broad. Um, but that is up to you. So let's move on. What is recommended? Recommended parameters are not necessary to change, but I do suggest that you consider changing them. Um, Sorry, can I just topic. ask a quick question? Because it's coming up a lot on the Discord. Um, and I have the same confusion, which is that if you have it on the previous slide, if you have a choice of uh, a closer Busco lineage like Brassicale is, why would you not use that? Uh, and Jill has said that, yes, you would use the closest, but you've used Verde Plante. So I'm just wondering why. Yeah, sorry about that. I default to Verde Plante for all plant genomes, but you are right. You can definitely use this, um, especially since I used it in OrthoDVD. And this is also an option in OrthoDV. But yes, you're right. You could yeah, go closer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, since a lot of the time you're working with um, a lot of non-model systems for this, we've been kind of benchmarking a lot of the very plante level, but you should absolutely select the closest yeah. option that's, that's available. So in this case, it would match the ortho DB as well. Yes, yeah. good question. Okay. I never uh, caught that. Got it. No, that's absolutely fine. And I think that's what a lot of people were confused about, and now they're not. So that's good. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so what's recommended? Well, the one I definitely would suggest that you consider providing a path for is this reference DB parameter. Um, 
And that is because if you don't, Easel will download the complete RefSeq database and not everybody wants that big database when there are other options. Um, and this is for functional annotation. So after we get through all the structural annotation, again, we're trying to identify protein coding genes, where they are in our genome, the coordinates. We then want to assign a functional annotation to each predicted gene. And to do that, we need to leverage some sort of database. And so for us, we expect a diamond database. And this is, if anybody has heard of NTAP, for a, another tool we have developed in our lab, which has been embedded into this pipeline. Um, and so I have provided a few important notes on how to download it, but let's kind of get into what this means. So by reference database, again, proteins, um, but you wanna condense this into the diamond format. So if you do that, you won't actually be able to see it, but this is just a look at what a database typically looks like. Um, to generate it, I have included scripts um, on the repository. Um, it's under the important notes. You can click on it and you'll find them. Generally, if you're working with plants, I would definitely recommend plant RefSeq database. You don't need the whole complete RefSeq database. It won't capture um, plant species. Well, it will, but it'll be more than you really want on your computer for lack of a better word. You can also download SwissProt, um, whatever you have locally on your computer, you can use that too, as long as it's in a diamond format. At the same time, Easel will run an eggnog gene family um, analysis in NTAP. So you'll have eggnog annotations and whatever you provide yourself um, or the complete RefSeq database. Eggnog is downloaded for you as well as an NTAP database. Um, I have not disabled that feature so that users can provide their own databases, and, um, but maybe in the future. For now, this is your influence on the NTAP stage, if that makes sense. Um, now for the optional parameters, there's a lot. Um, I keep adding more and more because I realize that people may wanna optimize what they're doing. Uh, and these again are optional, but if you really wanted to fine tune anything in the pipeline, you certainly could. So one notable example here, if um, you are aligning your RNA reads back to the genome, it's going to generate a mapping rate the mapping rate is by default set to 85. Let's say that your RNA reads are from a more distant related or a related species, but not your species. Maybe they don't map back to your genome that well, um, but you just don't have RNA. Can't find it on NCBI, you don't have it sequenced um, for your species. You might consider lowering this value. And so that's where these um, parameters kind of come handy. And you'll see in the next section um, where you can actually see how this impacts the results. Okay, so finally, we're gonna talk about how to submit a script. At the very end of this, I will, um, we will take a break, but I'm gonna show you where you can actually test run a fake script or a real script with fake data. So there's two methods, method one, um, is just listing the required input flags like so. So this line's always required. You need to include the hub GitLab. Um, next one doesn't like GitLab as much. You were on GitHub, you don't need this, but we're on GitLab. Uh, and then our repository, which is Plant Genomics Lab Easel, and then this profile, which I will explain more. Profile in this case could be Docker or Singularity. Um, for your institution. All of these flags, so dash dash is your own flag. One dash is typically just the next flow flag. Um, this is where you actually put in either your path, your genome, path through your user reads, path through SRA, if you wanted to do that, or BAM. Your Busco lineage, so again, I put Embryophyta for this example, but you can really do this 
same for your order. Um, taxon, um, which could be a genus, could be your species, could be a kingdom. Your order for ortho DV filtering. And then a training set, which is leveraged downstream for our structural annotation filtering. So this is method one. Um, this is all in a single script. Method two is a little different. I actually prefer to do it this way. I think it's more organized and it's nice to have a YAML file for each species I'm trying to annotate. Um, all you need to do is provide a all of your parameters, a colon. Oop. Oh, sorry. I think my screen stopped sharing. Is it still sharing? No, it's not. Uh oh, sorry guys. Okay, we're back. Can everybody see? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. So as I was saying, you would provide all of these parameters in a separate file and then provide it to your next flow script um, this way. You just add a param stash file flag um, with params.yaml or whatever the path in your YAML file is. And this will run easel the same way as the other one this way. All right, so this is an example of what a script looks like. For me, it's going to vary depending on you know which kind of HPC you're on. We utilize Slurm. Um, so, well, I don't know if that actually matters here, but um, important notes are this uh, header. You can see I don't provide a lot of memory or CPU. And that's because I, yeah, I use Slurm. And so the executor will actually utilize memory and CPU from a separate config file that is downloaded when you pull the repository. But as you'll see, if you don't have Slurm or SGG or something that will I guess organize your jobs, then you may want to increase this so that you can run it local. This Xanadu thing. So this is actually the name of our cluster and it's an institution profile. Um, you wouldn't put this on yours unless you're from the University of Connecticut like we are, um, or you have access to the terminal. But this is specific to my lab. It's a feature from Maxflow. Um, you can actually get your own configuration file for your institution um, through NF Core. There's a big list of them actually on their website. Um, and you can see if your institution's already on there. But this will really optimize your Nextflow experience, especially if you start using other pipelines um, besides Easel, which I highly recommend. This is what it looks like. Um, you can see there's this max memory, max CP, max time. A lot of people are worried about max time. You can set it to whatever you need it to be set to um, as a parameter. But in my Xanadu config file, it's actually preset for my institution. Likewise, we have the singularity cache directory. All of our containers are here. I don't have to keep re-downloading them. I definitely recommend that this, param or this parameter be used. It's on the GitLab if you wanna um, dive into what it's doing, it's just gonna pass. And finally, all of these different processes related to our cluster. Um, we have a general QoS and IMM QoS. It probably looks different for you. Um, and we're using Slurm, but there are other executors out there. This is uh, where I would suggest looking on the Nextflow website and seeing what they have to offer for executors, but um, they're not limited, let's put it that way. If you don't have an institutional profile um, and you don't have like a Slurm executor or you don't provide any kind of executor, by default, it will run local. Um, and so based off of your starting script, the processes will be paralyzed um, from the threads and memory that you have provided. 
Um, so now we will take a five minute break, but I want to offer this time to answer any questions too. Also, just kind of articulate that you can test easel right now if you really wanted to. I have um, a little test set in the Git. Oh my gosh, it keeps quitting on me. It's fine. Um, I have a test set on the Git that you can read about. All that requires you to do, sorry, um, is have Nexo downloaded, Singularity or Docker downloaded, and then you just run this command and it'll go through the pipeline. The results are garbage, but I did that on purpose so that it'd run fast. Um, but we'll go through in the next half of this session what the results of a run with Drosophila would look like. So we'll come back in another four minutes. Yeah, sure. four minutes. And if people want to ask questions, meanwhile, please type them in the Discord. I'm not risking any more. <laughs> um, public. Yeah, please, type, please type your questions in. We are here to answer them in the next uh, four minutes. I think people are using Discord, so that's great. Please keep typing there. Um, yeah, so for anybody who attended the Nextflow sessions or didn't doesn't already know how Nextflow works, uh, I didn't actually. I, I had to attend the Nextflow sessions as part of BGA. Yes, you would need a cluster or a machine that has Nextflow to try out the command that Cynthia has put up there. We could have tried doing it in Gitpod, but that would have required a whole, I mean, Gitpod wouldn't have been big enough to even run anything. So I, I know that if the Nextflow has been set up well, then yes, putting that in is all you need to run uh, something. Great. Yeah, I'm just we just shared. Yeah, and we just shared the functional annotation pipeline um, in there as well. Vidya shared that. So that's the NTAP tool that's wrapped within Easel that provides the functional annotation. And we just pushed out an update to this as well. So you can also use this independently um, to do, you know, to perform functional annotation on, say, a de novo assembled transcriptome or a set of gene models that you're annotating elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think Sadiq had a question earlier as well about how exactly the training sets were chosen when you say plant, invertebrate, and vertebrate. Um, for the training set, as in like if you would choose plant over invertebrate or how they were developed. How, I think how, they were I think developed. how they were developed, I think, is what he asked. Okay. So the way they were developed, um, we'll kind of talk about that in the next set of slides, but okay, that's the, fine. yeah, so I suppose we'll hold off on that. Um, yeah, we, we can, we're, that one's coming. So we'll be talking about that a little bit. Yeah. But they are very broad. They're basically high quality model species and but they are um, set up into broad taxonomic groups for this particular training. Mm -hmm. Sure, the RNA-seq mapping rate in this case is simply asking if 80, you know, whatever your input RNA set is, which in this case is typically paired Illumina RNA-seq reads that we're looking at about at least an 85% mapping rate against the, ref, uh, the reference. So, but really this is something that will likely, um, that we've talked about just modifying to a minimum number of reads aligning to the reference um, instead because that's actually more what we're targeting. Because if there's, say, contamination, or which is also common in a lot of RNA-seq data sets, that that 85% is not really what we're targeting so much as it is you know, that minimum amount of read, number of reads to have enough evidence to predict protein coding genes. And so that's typically at least 15 million, um, but we tend to like a bit more, say 20 to 25 million. So the default is set to, to throw out um, and maybe throw out. So say you provided 10 different RNA-seq data sets to Easel through SRA, it would filter out those that are mapping at less than 85% automatically. If that throughout all of your data sets, it would tell you that and it would stop. 
Um, if you needed to adjust that parameter, you could do that at that time as well. But like I said, this is something we'll probably modify more to just a minimum read, uh, total number of reads aligning the genome. Yeah, that makes sense. I understand the confusion. <laughs> Any more questions, please feel free to stick them in Discord. We'll get started in about one, is that right? Okay, we'll get started in about one minute. Yeah, the next good question. The next good question. Is it going to work if I install Nextflow with Conda? Yeah. So you can kind of install Nextflow, um, but you have to use containers for all of the tools embedded in Easel itself. So um, yeah, Conda load Nextflow, run Easel with Docker Singularity, if that's okay. Uh, right now it doesn't support Conda downloaded um tools it's hard to gather all of those unfortunately all right let's go <laughs> okay so in this next part of our workshop we're going to talk about annotation with a model organism we're looking at drosophila um i'm just going to walk you through essentially all of the steps that I took to generate an output, starting with the YAML file that I mentioned earlier. So this again is how you would start to build your script. You can see I have more parameters than what were mandatory because I um, have wanted to have control over, let's say, which reference database I used. So I actually already have complete protein diamond database downloaded on the cluster. Um, so I just provided a path. And oh, my screen keeps unsharing. So sad. Um, sorry. <laughs> We're gonna keep going, pretend that didn't happen. I think, I think um, we can it by saying Zoom works well. So this, I have another parameter here that I did not explain earlier. This is, you know, completely optional, but in our instant, or, ah, oh no, it's really saying no. Okay, we're just not gonna touch anything. So um, this tax ID parameter, the 7227, this is the Drosophila taxonomic ID from MCBI. Um, and I put it here so that I could remove all instances of this species from the OrthoDB Ortho database, because um, I wanted to get an accurate reflection of how EASO performs without the influence of model proteins. Because it's essentially like you're giving EASO the answer and that's not really fair when you're benchmarking. So this parameter, um, don't worry about it, but I put it there just to, you know, give you an accurate representation of how easily will perform with um, non-model that does is not represented in a database like OrthoDB. Okay, uh, let's forward. Uh, once again, check that your genome is masked. Often, if you download it from NCVI, uh, it's actually pre-masked, but if it's not, you can run it through repeat modeler and masker yourself. Currently, that is not a feature of the easel pipeline, but happy to add it in the future. Once again, this is our actual script, and I have module loaded Nextflow in Singularity because we actually have it um, 
module file available on our cluster, but if you wanted to, you know, run it with Conda, you could do source activate your Conda environment here for Nextflow, same for Singularity, um, and then you could run it as is. This profile, again, you will want to change based off of um, whether or not you have a config file through Nextflow. Um, if you don't, you can just run this with either Docker or Singularity flagged. And there's more about that again on the GitLab page. And then from here, you just sbatch um, script and you have a structural and a functional annotation with a lot in between. So what are the actual outputs of easel? There is going to be a uh, directory structure that looks something like this. It should look like this for everybody, no matter what species you run. Um, but what's actually in these directories? So we're going to start by talking about 0, 01 reads. And you know, it's kind of intuitive. You hear reads, you think um, RNA seq data. Um, and so this is just a tree of what that directory looks like after running Drosophila. Um, this is the first step in this little cartoon of our pipeline. Let's start with what I had input. So this is um, my user reads. I provided, uh, I believe, seven different FASTQ files that were already on my cluster that were locally downloaded. We then run FASTP. If you have not heard of FASTP, it is just going to trim your reads. Uh, it's a quality control measure that um, we take when assess or like providing RNA-seq data into our pipeline. And so doing so, you now have trimmed FASTQ files and these will be in a trimmed reads directory. What does the output of FASTP look like? You can see that in the actual quality control directory and there will be a JSON and HTML file. FASTP has this really nice looking HTML if you wanna actually see what before and after filtering looks like. Generally, we're concerned with total reads. Um, if you drop a lot, that is an issue, uh, but we have conditional statements to check. So as Jill was saying before, um, really we wanna focus on these total reads and it being above a certain threshold, because um, this will tell us a little bit about the coverage we have across our genome. And we also have a mean read length. So here it's set to 40 and here it's set to 15 million. Um, I've tried to highlight uh, with the params dot total reads and params dot mean length that you can adjust this in your YAML file or in the script yourself if you really want to. And then doing so, let's say you raise this to 70, which I believe is the default I actually have. Um, this would be dropped, this read here and you would see it down there. Um, all right, so the next directory, it's not super important. It's just an index. Uh, it's not going to really tell you anything um, that you wanna know, but maybe you need an index somewhere because you have one for your genome. That's just this part here. It's for HiSat2. Um, again, an index is just kind of making it easier for a tool to you know, look across your genome assembly much like the index of a book. So not too much to worry about in that directory, but let's talk about um, some of the conditional statements that also require a genome assembly. So as I had mentioned before, we want you to repeat mask your genome and you can do that with repeat modeler or repeat masker, um, or it can come pre um, soft mask for you. Regardless, you just want a mass genome for your, oh no, once again, sorry guys. Um, for your, your params, let me just, ooh. Man, Zoom really messes with the flow, huh? <laughs> okay, so um, for the params, let me get rid of that. For the params genome, 
this again is just a pass to your soft mesh genome. We have conditional statements embedded into the pipeline to make sure your genome is masked. Anything greater than 25% mass is typically normal. If you have a smaller genome, I find that it will be less than 25% mass, um, like Arabidopsis and even Drosophila, they're about 100 megabases. So it'll throw a warning, but it won't kick you out just in case that, that's weird to you. Um, the error will happen if anything's less than 10% mass or 0% mass. However, um, this is species dependent. You know, maybe you really do have something that is less than 10% mast. Um, you can adjust this parameter. Um, we put these in here just to make sure you don't go down like a huge pipeline with really bad data. So they're little quality checks for you as the user. Um, and then there's going to be a log. This is modal output. It'll just tell you the percentage of your genome mass and will either give you a warning or won't, or it'll just exit. Okay, so we've covered RNA-seq and genome, but like, um, what about this alignments directory combining both together? So this is a, again, a tree for our alignments directory, but we're gonna focus in on BAM and mapping rates. This is this part of the section of our um, little figure there. So when I talk about alignments, all it requires is a soft mesh genome and your trimmed RNA-seq data. I said two is the tool, and then you're left with a binary SAM file, which is called a BAM file. And so this is where all of your RNA-seq genome alignment data is stored. Uh, this is necessary for transcriptome assembly but it's also necessary to assess like another, or what I mentioned before, it's also necessary to assess the alignment rate to some, some degree, you know, as Jill said, there might be a lot of contamination, this might be lower than you expect. Um, but for all of our BAM files, we have alignment rates across our genome. Um, and so this is a conditional statement uh, it'll tell you the library and the alignment rate from high set two. You can see that this um, library was dropped because it was less than 85% um, spanning across the genome. Uh, param stat rate is how you would adjust this. You could drop it really low if you were only interested in looking at read length, for instance. Okay, so. Following the alignment, you have your BAM files. We're now going to go into an assembly stage. And by assembly, I mean transcriptome assembly. And so let's say you successfully run easel. You got this directory. You'll notice it's pretty big because we have this string tie two and a side class directory. These are two independent transcriptome assemblers. So keep that in mind. Um, this 04 assembly directory is spanning this part of our pipeline. What's actually happening though is the BAM file and genome sequence are going into um, our respective tools. So in this case, we go into string tied two. It's going to generate a transcriptome. We'll actually generate as many transcriptomes as BAM files you have to offer and create a consensus. Um, this is where that string type 2.gtf file would be. Again, you can also um, see the sci class output. Uh, sci class is transcriptome assembler, different from string type 2. Same idea though, it's going to um, create a transcriptome for each BAM file and then have a consensus. And, and this is called sci class vote. So we utilize a dual approach um, with sci, uh, string tie and sci class just for transcript resolution. Uh, sci class claims to predict you know, rare isoforms and we wanna leverage that downstream when we're trying to make predictions about where genes are. Um, and you'll see that we kind of combined everything together in the end. The next step of our assembly um, process and what you'll find in this assembly directory is this frame selection 
directory, and this will be for both string tie two and side class. Frame selection is essentially just capturing, you know, your start and your stop codons, so your protein coding genes. Oops, okay. Sorry. Okay, we're back. Okay, so um, it's going to capture your protein coding genes and it's going to leverage eggnog protein homology to do so. Um, and so that's why you'll see like a lot of eggnog prefixes on, oh no, oh, it's <laughs> I don't know why it's happening. <laughs> Okay. We're just jinxed today. Don't worry about it. Uh, what happened? Oops. This has been quite a chaotic session, huh? <laughs> Don't worry about it. That's I I I did try to tell other people as well that you know this is informal, it's relaxed, it's not meant to be this super polished presentation. So don't worry it's about like, it. anything goes wrong. I'm yeah. so stressed. <laughs> okay, um, we're back. We're gonna try this again. <laughs> so as I was um I was mentioning, this frame selection step is necessary if we want to, you know, identify the protein or the protein coding regions. So like that CDS feature. Um, in our transcriptome assemblies. And we do leverage eggnog, and I was kind of mentioning this before, a lot of the prefixes on the files have eggnog in it. Just know that relates directly to how we're picking or picking um, the coding regions. Okay. So here we have the CDS. CDS stands for nucleotides. It's your ATG. We also have protein. So same situation, um, except the output file is PEP for proteins. You have your start and your stop protein um, all in the frame selection directory. And you can kind of fish through that um, if you run easel. After frame selection, uh, we are going to cluster. So keep in mind, I'm doing all of this so I can have a gene model for Augustus training. So by clustering, I mean we're taking our nucleotide sequences and we're running it through a tool. Um, we are using vSearch. It is a bit faster than uSearch. And it's essentially creating a centroid. So anything in proximity of whatever you know distance we set, in our case, we set it to 0.8 will be collapsed into one representative sequence. Um, it's really important to try to eliminate redundancy before going into a machine learning pipeline like Augustus, because you want unique genes going in when you start to train. Um, so that's why we have this step here. Um, this is in the clustering directory, if you're interested. But what's our actual gene model? Um, to us, the best candidate for structural annotation prediction is complete open reading frames. So you'll notice trans decoder outputs partial open reading frames. Um, it might not start with an ATG, but eventually it does. We want it to start in, uh, with a start codon and end with a stop codon. And so that's what this um, complete open reading frame CDS file is, is looking like, and this is also the model. So here we go. This is your structural annotation derived from string tie two or psi class alone. Um, this is that non-machine learning um, approach that Vidya talked about, but filtering complete open reading frames and clustering. The reason we have this GFF file is so that we can provide it first to Augustus, but also downstream, combine it back into our predictions. Because even though RNA-seq might not capture all the genes, it can capture a lot of them, um, and we wanna leverage that. So let's move on to the next directory. 
So I've already talked about our RNA-seq reads, building an index, aligning RNA reads to the genome, and generating a transcriptome assembly. Um, now we're going to dive into what's necessary to run Augustus. And Augustus, if you do not know, is a machine learning tool uh, utilizing general or generalized human Markov models to make predictions on where genes are. And hints are really useful if you want to create an accurate gene prediction. Um, it gives you an idea of where certain features are from nucleotide and protein sequences. So ab initio prediction, um, if you run Augustus as is, you know, no extrinsic evidence that is technically an ab initio prediction. It's just using the target genome itself. Um, easel does not do that. It requires RNA-seq evidence. Um, so that's where the hints come into play. So once again, hints are extrinsic evidence about the location and structure of genes in a particular GFF format. And it can, and it can come in many different forms. Um, We've just called EST, it's in relation to our nucleotide sequences. All we do here is we take what we already um, assembled decoding regions from trans decoder and align it back to the genome. Now keep in mind, this isn't just the complete open reading frames, this is everything. And in doing so, we Hold the phone. Oh my gosh. Create a structural annotation. <laughs> um, but oh my god. <laughs> it's it's all okay, everybody. We're making it happen. <laughs> Something with someone connecting. I think it's yeah, it probably the thing she might do or something. Oh goodness. Was it something else? All right. How does the time check? Just for a chance. We're good. We're good. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, here we go. This. Okay, so you have a new structural annotation, but this time it's based off of all of the nucleotide sequences coming out of um, trans decoder, not just the ones that are complete open reading frames, um, because we want to capture you know, um, as much as we possibly can from what we have generated from our RNA-seq evidence. And when you create a hints file, the format looks similar to a GFF file, but it's a little bit funky. Um, you'll notice that instead of like features such as gene, exon, CDS, um, you'll get something that is a little bit broader. So this EP stands for exon part, for instance. Um, and then this ninth column is not really an attributes column for your gene ID or transcript ID. It's actually telling you, um, you know, what's the source so Augustus can read it. And in this case, E is standing for EST, but really this is just all of our transcript evidence um, combined into a hints file. So again, this is where you see this eggnog that EST hints at GFF. It's derived from the eggnog. Um, homology-based transdecoder run. Okay, so protein hints are another important aspect of this pipeline. Um, we've kind of found that even though it can increase fragmentation, it also pulls in a lot of weight for generating really accurate structural annotations. Um, so we provide protein hints as well first being in the same form as we provided the nucleotide sequences. So proteins directly derived from our transcriptome assembly and frame selection output. We have been using Miniprot, which I really, it's really fast, um, frequently being updated to over genome fetter or exonerate um, because we find it performs fairly well when we're benchmarking. Um, oh my gosh. It's okay. Yes. Do you want to take a share from the laptop? Wait, instead of the desktop, you can share from the desktop. Oh, sure. It's fine. 
going to try. It it can't be a cable issue because you're only using one laptop, right? Or are you using more than one? I'm using one laptop. Um, I'm wondering if this is a connection issue through. Oh, sorry. Um, through our little HDMI cable. We're going to try it from my laptop, see if, if Zoom likes that. OK, so as I was saying, the protein hints are similar to ESD hints. They're just using the, the protein output from trans decoder. And aligning them back is slightly different. Um, we're using Miniprot, which is designed specifically for proteins. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are other options um, like genome flutter and exonerate, but they're a bit heavy, especially as you start using larger genome assemblies. Uh, Miniprot is super fast. So um, the output is another structural annotation, um, this time with the protein, and this can be found in a respective hints directory. It's not on the screen, but if you fish through the O5 hints, you'll see where these live. Um, wanted to mention, so in this section here, I see orthodb sequences. Um, this is a, essentially like your extrinsic evidence that is not derived directly from RNA-seq that you provide. This is from like another source, such as the orthodb database. Um, and by default, I set this to true in the pipeline. Uh, that's where that order parameter comes into play. So it can pull proteins from orthodb directly. And in doing so, actually, I think this is pretty, can everybody still see my screen? Sorry. Yes, okay, so <laughs> it'll pull proteins from orthodb directly and like we did before, use Miniprot. Oops. Oh, Molly. Can you just keep it off our screen screen maybe? Yeah. So it's going to use Miniprot um, and generate this orthodb GTF file. And these seem pretty big depending on which order you use. So if you are a little bit more broad, um, it might capture more, but generally it's species dependent. So if you have a really closely related species in the database, it's going to align a lot. Um, if you are working with a species that is more distantly related to what's available in the OrthoDB database, you might not have a very big GTF file because there aren't as many alignments. Um, so things to keep in mind. Okay, so as I said before, this is all in the respective directory for the transcriptome assembler that you are looking at. We do this for string tie two and psi class. You're going to see a lot of Augustus runs from all of these hints in the next slide. Um, but this is just kind of demonstrating again, like the hints file looks a little wonky. We now have a CDS part, um, but this, uh, let's see, the source is now a P. So P stands for protein. Okay, so let's get into how we, you know, make predictions, like how do we generate our structural annotation? So we have our two gene models, um, psi class and string type two. It's just emphasizing the fact that we essentially run the transcriptome assembly twice and frame selection twice and clustering twice. And we filter for complete open reading frames twice. Um, so we have two gene models that are going into Augustus. Now, as I kind of explained, Augustus is a tool that was developed in 2004. It's still widely used today because it does a decent job and this is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, and it'll predict alternative transcripts um, with the addition of protein and transcript hints by leveraging a generalized hidden Markov model. And it only needs 250 testing genes and 100 training genes from each gene model, which is why we're kind of okay with filtering them down. Um, to the highest quality gene set possible. So it has a small training and test set because it's making predictions 
about where genes will or won't be based off of the species you're working with and the evidence you provide before actually providing the entire genome. Once you provide the entire genome, along with your training set generated from the gene models, you can start to make predictions about where genes are without, you know, having a clue if it's totally correct. So the output is then a whole bunch of structural annotation files, the GFF file. Um, you'll see there are six on the screen, and that's because I leverage protein hints from transdecoder and orthodb. So we have two separate Augustus runs, um, transcript hints from Cyclas and string type two. It's all doubled. The reason we do it separately is because benchmarking shows that if you concatenate all the hints, it does not do as well. Um, so there's going to be a lot of predictions in that predictions directory before we combine them all together. So here we go. These are our structural annotations that we have collected across the pipeline from two different transcriptome assemblers. We have um, three from Augustus for Shringtai and Cyclos. And then we also have this model um, output 100% based on RNA and genome alone. So there's no machine learning here. It's just, again, the Shringtai and Cyclos structural annotation. Um, and why do we want to have all these? Because we want to leverage as many true positives as we can, even at the expense of, you know, pulling in a lot of false positives. Um, and you'll see that it's fine to do that because we will filter as much out as possible and hopefully be left with more true positives than not. So... AJAT is a tool that I frequent now. It's really useful if you're working with structural annotations. I would recommend looking it up. It's this little um, set of Perl scripts where you can do a lot of fun manipulations to your GFF file. Um, one case, it can actually merge annotations together. Um, and so what it's doing is it's going to combine transcripts that are identical in structure and it'll keep transcripts that are unique. And this is our unfiltered combined model. So we now have one structural annotation. With that one structural annotation, um, we're fairly confident it has a lot of genes and transcripts that we do not want. So this is where, um, the novelty of easel kind of comes into play where we start to filter out transcripts that we don't think are real. So in this case, transcripts that don't have uh, the correct translation initiation start say. And this is a secondary feature that we can consider, um, but it's one of many where if we want to accurately predict if a start site exists or not, in a model species, um, it's pretty easy because, you know, again, Vidya had mentioned when we're working with models, we have the answer. We have, you know, wet lab experiments that created a pretty much ground truth for the model we're looking at. We're pretty confident in the genes and the transcripts predicted. So if we were to align our unfiltered combined structural annotation back to that reference, um, we could see, hey, this actually has a true start site, or no, it doesn't. But in non-models, it's not so easy because, again, we don't have a true structural annotation. Um, why else would you run an annotation pipeline, right? So to combat that, what we do is we take a whole bunch of features, so primary and secondary features, um, related to our transcript, um, transcripts in our structural annotation and genes, a variety of tools, and we use this to run a random forest algorithm. All right, to kind of put this into perspective a bit more, random forest algorithms require a set of features that you're interested in, 
it could be continuous or binary features. Um, you can have your identifier. So this is the top three genes and transcripts from um, my Drosophila structural annotation. I just pulled them randomly. Um, we have all the features I mentioned before. Support is taking into account how many of the transcripts derived from those six um, structural annotations prior to merging captured the same gene and transcript. So in this case, we might have more confidence in gene one, T1 transcript because four out of the six annotations said, hey, this exists. Uh, this one, on the other hand, only one thinks that transcript exists. And that might not be enough to keep it, but it's possible the other features will say, hey, this is actually a novel transcript. It's unique. Um, we need to keep it. And so that's just one feature, but we also have more like primary features. So um, we can look at our exon count. We also have this eggnog feature, which is just aligning the transcripts back to an eggnog database saying, hey, this has a hit or no, it doesn't. Very similar to what we did with frame selection. OrthoDB has a um, multi-mapping moment going on, but if it aligns back to your OrthoDB database, it will be presented in this column. Um, this seems to hold a lot of weight in making predictions, uh, which makes sense to me, especially if it's well established in the OrthoDB database, which you know, even though I removed Drosophila, it's still frequently being aligned back. Expression is um, related to RNA-seq. How is that being, like how much buildup do you see across the genome? Is this gene or transcript actively being expressed across all the RNA uh, libraries that you provide? Molecular weight and length are um, in relation to the transcript itself. So how many base pairs, what's the weight, CDS repeat content within your um, coding region, there might be repetitive content, which you know is fine. It's soft masked, um, but how much of your coding region is actually repetitive content? So lowercase letters divided by total um, number of bases. GC content is just looking at the percentage of um, GC nucleotides, GNC, free energy, and GC ratio. These are related to um, the secondary feature, um, protein folding, and they help you establish whether or not there is a true translation initiation site based off of our benchmarking. So these three do a really good job at that. Um, what does the training set look like? This is where that parameter comes into play. So you have plant, you have invertebrate, you have vertebrate. This um, looks pretty arbitrary right now. You can't see you know, any gene or transcript or species information. It's just a big um, spreadsheet essentially of all of the same features, but now with two different um, targets. So an F1 and a target this is the translation initiation site, which I'll explain a little bit more in a sec. Um, this is derived from a bunch of invertebrate model organisms. Um, we have to use model organisms because we want to know what the true answer is. We cannot use non-models for this. Um, and it's very similar to how you would create a training set for Augustus or if anybody's heard of Felixer too. Um, we want to capture something clade specific because there seems to be a difference if you were to run Drosophila with the plant versus the vertebrate versus the invertebrate training set. Um, there's little nuances across clades that are reflected in these features. Okay, so um, let's just quickly talk about Sorry, the random question oh. just because it's on the discord um, uh, on the previous slide. Yep, so you've got lots of features. Uh, and I think the question is, could you clarify a bit on how free energy works? Uh, so do you want it to be folding or not folding? Or because um, the example you had given of folding looked like an RNA level folding rather than, yeah, that's an RNA folding, right? Not a, 
CDS, not a protein folding. Yes, this is folded at the nucleotide level. And so the parameters that are, in, and when we were kind of testing these parameters, we were taking in the overall free energy, we were taking in the free energy around the putative start site. And we were also taking in the position of where the start site actually is located in terms of the stem and loop. But I think that the most important and predictive feature was the actual um, free energy around the predicted start site. And that's the value that goes into as one of the features. And I don't know that we have those slides here in terms of which features are most predictive um, overall. I do not, but I will tell you uh, OrthoDB alignment, free energy, and GC ratio are really predictive for. Oh, yeah. Go back to that. I think you, that's what you had there. Um, Exactly. So those actually, the folding is actually kind of a unique aspect of this pipeline, and it's something that does a pretty good job of distinguishing um, what we believe are, you know, two true transcripts from the data set um, in there as well. And just so that I can, I mean, I think I've understood this, but uh, in case anybody else has that question as well, please drop it. So the idea is that once you get a transcript, so a CDS, uh, a, yeah, a transcript, you're making sure the transcript initiation site is not in a folded bit. It's like in an exposed bit. Is that right? Probably, yes, exactly. That's what that value is attempting to represent. And we, we looked at it in a few different ways in terms of what the output is from, in this case, via an RNA. Um, but that was the actual free energy value ended up being the most predictive um, of that. And that is indeed once we have a set of potential transcripts. Sure, sure. That's really cool. Yeah, because I don't think any of the other tools do that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, right. Um, as Jill was saying, when we're looking at a translation initiation start site and whether it exists, and we're doing this in the context of a random forest algorithm, um, we're really looking at a binary feature. Um, so, yes or no it is found in a model versus um, yes or no, it's predicted to be found in our unfiltered structural and input. And so this uh, little cartoon is showing you how random forest works. It's creating a bunch of decision trees and over all of the features, it's going to generate a, a final result after majority voting, after X paths have been um, went down. And the final result is a binary output. So in this case, if you look at our feature um, matrix, if you see a zero under the target um, part in like the see the model training set, that means that there was no translation initiation site predicted. Let's see. You can see like uh, which transcripts that are in the unfiltered model have a predicted or not a predicted um, TAS site in the classifier prediction CSV file in that filtering directory here. Okay, so we were talking about F1 a lot. Um, F1 score is the harmonic mean of precision and sensitivity. It's a pretty good way to assess if you are you know, generating a high quality structural annotation, if you have a ground truth um, reference genome annotation available. So consider it like aligning your structural annotation back to the reference, how well it aligns, how many true positives are indicated by sensitivity, um, how many false positives by precision. We want it to be as high as possible, higher the better. Um, so we we try to leverage this metric um, to further filter our transcripts. Um, oh, looks like I actually explained this a little bit. Okay. So um, in doing so with a model organism, let's say Drosoph Drosophila is a model organism, so we could do it with this. But um, if we ran that assessment, right, we aligned our structural annotation back to a reference, we could generate F1 for each transcript that we have. Um, and if the transcript level is 
really low, we might consider removing it. Um, for instance, zero means there's no alignment at all. So we would want to remove this. We don't think that this is a true transcript or we know it's not a true transcript. But again, we don't know the answer with non-model species. So we have to once again, leverage a random forest. But this time, um, because our data is continuous, we're actually going to do a regressor. So a regressor is only different in that instead of having zero and one as an input, we have zero through 100. Um, and so the output is going to scale from zero to 100, which means we need to have um, a cutoff. <laughs> and 80% string stringency seems to capture the most amount of true positives without the expense of removing, um, or it seems to remove the most amount of false positives without like reducing sensitivity. But this varies between species. Um, you can assess if you are filtering too much based off of like certain metrics like BUSCO, which um, I'll show you at the end, but just keep in mind, you can always change this um, with the regressor parameter if you want to be more or less stringent with how you're removing transcripts. Um, the final prediction is in a CSV file um, in filtering too. Okay, so combined, um, we have a filtered structural annotation. Um, and hopefully we are maintaining sensitivity and increasing precision um, after all of this random forest algorithmic um, processes are taken. All right, so what do we do um, now? We have our final predictions there. Uh, let me just show you one more time. So in our final predictions directory, this is the structural annotations. I give the unfiltered and filtered. Um, you have coding regions, so, um, or actually the nucleotide sequences, the protein sequences, GTF and GFF. Um, you only really need one uh, format, but both are nice to have because sometimes you're going downstream from structural annotation and it requires a certain tool might require GTF or GFF file. Um, but that's all there in the final predictions directory. Now let's talk about um, the metrics. So something I really love about Easel and wanted to um, put into it was the metrics section, um, because after you run your structural annotation, you want to know how it did, you know, without taking a lot of extra steps. So this is where all those BUSCO parameters come into play, right? Um, or one of the reasons. In our metrics area, you'll see we run BUSCO and AGAT um, to generate uh, summary statistics, as well as a BUSCO completeness score. Um, so how complete is the annotation? Generally, BUSCO actually, uh, the ideal range is under 90, or between 90 and 95%. I don't think they say over 95% is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So keep that in mind. Um, depends on the, head depends yeah. on the organism. This also depends on how uh, well represented it is in the uh, BUSCO lineage or database you provide. I think conifers, for instance, aren't, or gymnast ferns in general, aren't well represented. Um, so the BUSCO score might reflect that. Um, things to keep in mind. Uh, when you're looking at the BUSCO score, um, <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Okay, you're gonna notice something that is pretty odd about our BUSCO score. <laughs> it looks good, don't get me wrong. The completeness is really high, um, but the duplication is very high too. Um, and we think this is because we are capturing a lot of alternative transcripts and it's being reflected across the gene space as a duplicate. However, we might want to further condense our um, gene models down, you know, to create a single representative of a transcript. And so future direction, um, this isn't for all the species, this is definitely for Drosophila for some reason. Um, future direction is to create a more of a consensus on if the alternative transcripts and 
where they're reflected in the gene is essentially identical enough to collapse. So that happens. That is one of the consequences of merging six different structural annotations together. Um, but can always take the longest isoform. Okay, so um, I'm going to use my privilege as having microphone things to ask. <laughs> Somebody okay. on Discord has pointed out I've never seen 100% Busco ever. So well done. But also, it is Drosophila. So the Augustus yeah, model is just... good, and the genome assembly was good, and all of that. Um, uh, my question is, could you, so you're saying you want to take alternate transcripts, but could you do a metric which doesn't do collapse alternate transcripts, it just takes the longest gene model? So you just take all the exons and say, we it's do, not a real we transcript. Do, is we, that what do you have both, we do have both of those represented in the output currently. Um, it's okay. just that right, right now, some of the alternative transcripts are actually being split out into two different independent genes. And so we have a fix on this to kind of go back to the features to help select that one. And so we'll be pushing that out hopefully okay. in a week or so, which will reduce that duplication rate. Yeah. Um, is, our, is our goal. I so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is, that is, we do actually provide a Busco for the entire set, including alternative transcripts, but then also independent genes as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So by default now, I actually have it output longest isoform in addition to all of the alternative transcripts and the filtered output. So um, in, opposed to what I showed, it, it will be an unfiltered GFF, a filtered GFF, and then a filtered with longest isoform GFF in yep. that final predictions directory. Um, but I don't know, we're still working through this duplication thing. No, I, I actually think this is really wonderful and fascinating because you're clearly telling us, you know, well, we see this, but we see this, and this is how we're fixing it. And I think that's absolutely amazing. So that's great. Don't worry about that. Great. All right. We're going to keep going. I know Busco score is pretty insane for this. I've never seen 100% either. Um, but Trisophila is a supermodel. Um, Let's see, quality. So the mono multi-ratio again, Vidya kind of introduces this into um, the welcome to the big leaves paper, which you can um, find, I think it's in the discord, but we're looking at the percentage of predicted genes that are monoexonic um, in relation to multi-exonic. Uh, what is this telling us? Well, one of our postdocs, Carl Fetter, he's not here with us, but he's been actively working um, on easel is doing a meta-analysis. And so far the data suggests that 0.2 is actually very much uh, where you would expect a mono multi ratio to be. This is pretty conserved in eukaryotic species, um, but it could be clade specific. It is, uh, overall, it is a good metric. Um, if you see mono multi over one, for instance, that's kind of a sign there's a lot of fragmentation because um, you're, you know, your multi-exotic genes are getting split. So how do we do, um, let's see. So in our unfiltered output, if it loads, you can see that I calculate the um, monomultai by taking number of genes and AGAT actually outputs this huge statistical summary that you can look at um, in the directory, but this is just a little snippet of it. it has the number of single exon genes, and then you, in easel, it'll calculate this for you, but um, you can see that we're pretty well below 0.2, which means we're doing, doing decently with the fragmentation issue that we've seen um, in other annotation tools that start to work with more complex genomes. Um, so metric, definitely recommend using it just, um, as a PSA for making sure that we go beyond Busco score. All right, so that is two metrics. There's actually a third metric, but it's embedded in this functional annotation directory. Um, again, Easel is combining structural and functional annotation in one pipeline, uh, very user-friendly. Uh, you don't have to run anything separately for lack of a better word. So NTAP is the tool we use and it creates a lot of files. I didn't want to put a tree structure here because it's uh, pretty intense, but let's see what it actually is outputting. 
So one of our quality metrics is reciprocal blast. This is output in the summary. And this is just looking at um, essentially how many genes or transcripts are annotated based off of that diamond database you provide. So again, I mentioned that the complete RefSeq database is default, what Easel will use. But if you provide um, plant RefSeq or SwissProt or whatever you want, um, you can assess the quality with those as well. And there's really no right answer. 9,100% um, is everybody's ideal range. It really, it, it truly depends on uh, how represented your species is in the database a lot of the time. Um, so for Drosophila, um, we might expect it to be higher because again, it's a really well-studied organism and so are all of its relatives. And they can see that at a 70-70 reciprocal blast, so 70 coverage, um, across the query and the sequence or in the database, we have an uh, annotation rate of own 89% with our unfiltered. Um, I think part of this is we're capturing some fragmented multi-exonic genes, um, which Vidya mentions in her paper too, how the annotation rate shifts as you remove that fragmentation um, to something like this in our filtered. I'm just taking a little bit to load. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> 97% after filtering. So this is good. This is another way to assess the quality of your annotation. Um, Takeaway, BUSCO score combined with modern multi-exonic, as well as number of genes and transcripts predicted. I don't mention that here, but it should be falling in a range you would expect. Um, Genes uh, are like, again, kind of conserved across eukaryotic species. I think it'd be pretty weird to see 100,000 genes. Um, things to keep in mind, uh, annotation rate is relevant, but also, of course, the functional annotations are in the directories respective to the unfiltered and filtered, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, maybe you wanna go back and pull some of the unfiltered genes back in. Um, I don't currently have the functional annotation gene names attached to the structural annotation. Like you won't see it in the ninth column or the attribute section, it's separate. Um, but I'm hoping I can add that. I think that will be really useful to individuals who are um, using the structural annotation downstream. All right, so final stretch. Just, oh yeah, okay. so. This is kind of what I was saying. When you look at the output of NTAP, which is our functional annotation tool, this is what you will see. This is a tiny little piece of a very big matrix that it outputs. Um, this is your query sequence. Uh, the IDs are very weird because I merged them together. Um, another thing I could change, huh? Uh, <laughs> and the description is based off of that reference database you supply. It will also output an eggnog family assignment because, again, it does run on that ontology um, part in NTAP. And another thing to keep in mind is when I talk about annotation rate, functional annotation rate, it's only based off of the, um, the similarity search. But there's also gene family. Um, so often that annotation rate is actually pretty, pretty high um, because the gene family is well annotated that eggnog database. So there's a log at the in the directory for NTAP with all of the different um, breakdowns of how it's annotating um, that you can look at and it's very informative. Okay, so let's see if we can wrap this up. Easel summary.txt. This is the final text file that you will see. Um, this is only bits and pieces of it, but as I was showing you throughout, we have um, different conditional statements that either remove reads or um, remove alignments. And we also have the unfiltered and filtered metrics. So total number of genes, transcripts, the alignment rate, multi-exotic rate, and the BUSCO score. Um, and so you can kind of compare at the very end of a run 
you know, how am I doing? Uh, did I remove too many genes or transcripts so I need to adjust any parameters? Um, and generally these three metrics for a non-model do a good job at telling you, yeah, I did, I did okay with my structural annotation. Okay, so now to kind of do a comparison. Um, it's hard to compare sometimes when tools are very different, but we're gonna try. Uh, so here we have four different structural annotations. I included the filtered and unfiltered for easel, um, but I also have breaker three, which uh, they just released their preprints. No, yes. Um, and string tie two, which is a RNA seq assembler. Um, all these tools took in six RNA libraries, the same six, and a soft mass genome for Drosophila. We also have a different tool, which is very cool. I like this tool, it's Helixer. It is a deep learning inspired structural annotation tool. And like Augustus, it only requires a soft mass genome. Also like Augustus, if you're running it in ab initio mode, it has invertebrate, vertebrate, and plant training sets. So let's say you don't have RNA-seq data, nothing's really closely related um, that you can use. Helixir is a nice you know, middle ground uh, if you just wanna get an assessment of how a structural annotation with the genome alone looks. Anyways, um, so we can kind of see how these different tools perform starting with just the unfiltered versus filtered, this kind of shows you why it's necessary to do. Um, the F1 score of our gene level and transcript, this is F1, I should have read that, but um, F1 is telling us, hey, we did okay compared to the existing reference or we did really bad. Um, and at the gene level, so at least like one of the transcripts is aligning to the reference in a gene is really, really good for our easel filter. You can see it jumps up quite a bit um, between the unfiltered and filtered for even transcript level two, because we are effectively removing false positives with our random forest algorithm. It also means that we're hopefully maintaining um, our sensitivity. And I'll show that in the next slide, but this is a very nice gene level. Um, I didn't think we'd ever get that high, but we somehow did. Um, there's even more work that we can do to get even higher. Transcript level is something that you know, might be a direct consequence of what we're seeing with that BUSCO duplication, um, possibly con condensing down transcripts and keeping a consensus on which one is really, really correct. Um, if they're like very much the same, might improve this. But yeah, other tools do perform a little bit better that also use RNA um, libraries and soft mass genome, uh, like Breaker 3 does a little bit better there. Um, both are fairly comparable, in my opinion. It's just sometimes it's preference. Um, but you'll see with Easel, as you start introducing more complex genomes, it's a lot easier to get a high quality annotation just because it's able to drop all of the nonsense that is produced from Augustus sometimes because the bigger the genome, um, more repetitive content, the more of a hot mess it can be um, when it's coming out. And so you'll often see um, something larger than Drosophila producing 100,000 genes, uh, 200,000 transcripts, I just recently annotated the cicada genome, for instance, which is seven gigs, um, easel output, like 150,000 transcripts. And I'm like, that is not right <laughs> in the unfiltered. And then it went through filtering and it was a normal number. We we're all happy. <laughs> it's like 20, similar to like 25, 30,000 genes. Um, and Busca went way up, annotation rate went up, way up. So um, finding ways to effectively filter um, you'll see differences across the different complexities of genomes that are out there. Um, runtime. Runtime is variable, kind of hard to calculate actually because of how we ran each tool. Um, Easel, for instance, is going to run 
way more than the other tools do. So I think two days is actually very appropriate for taking RNA-seq data, assembling a transcriptome, running Augustus, running a functional annotation and all of the random forest um, algorithms, Busco, all those metrics. Um, you might notice it takes a little longer, um, but I think it's worth it at the end of the day because you, know, you get a lot more out of it. There's less work after you have your structural annotation. Um, the other tools dependent on if you provide BAM files or you start all the way from the beginning, um, it varies. Um, Elixir is very fast, for instance, if you're using a GPU. Um, I didn't in this instance. So it, it's really dependent on the hardware at the end of the day um, and how many resources you can provide. But just the final image I wanted to show is kind of that precision versus sensitivity and, and just, you know, knocking in the point that with our filtered filtering approach, we're doing a decent job at maintaining sensitivity. So if you look at the circles for um, easel, the open circle is unfiltered and the dark circle is filtered. You can see that sensitivity always is just very you know much, it's just going across and it's all okay. Um, precision actually is moving to the right, right? So y-axis isn't changing much. Precision, the x-axis, the filtered um, features are improving, which is um, why we're seeing a higher F1 score. Okay, so I think that is all I have. If my slides move forward. I have no idea how we're doing on time. We're about at time. So yeah. Whoa, okay. <laughs> so we can definitely take questions. So we have time for questions anybody has. And I think the, the question, there's a question in the Discord about the total number of transcripts. And so is but even 28,000 genes, 42,000 transcripts is double or triple. Um, I think over Helix and Burger 3, right, for Drosophila. Right. So it is actually higher than um, I want it to be, but I think that it is again an art, like a consequence of duplication. Yeah. So I think that comes back to the same duplication rate we're seeing in the Busco score that we talked about. The fix that we intend to put in will just collapse some of those. What basically alternative transcripts are getting found into independent genes and then collapsing that back will reduce that, I think, redundancy. Basically, yeah. Yeah, I've done some preliminary tests and it actually does fall closer to what you'd expect in the gene count for Drosophila, which is actually around like 13 to 15,000 genes. It, it gets closer to that when I do some duplication fixing. Um, so would you say that we should, I mean, if I wanted to use easel today, would you say don't use it for production because of this um, because of this issue right now and you know use it as a test, use it to get things that you're not getting with other tools, use it to get this extra filtering, which I think Sam also asked, you know, can we just run the filtering step on a structural prediction from somewhere else? Because it's really useful to know that the transcription start site is not there, the initiation site is not there. Is that how you would recommend? somebody use it today. And obviously when you make the improvements, we should use it, but I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, um, so I've seen duplication rates look completely normal in other species. Um, I'm not sure why that is the case in some instances and not others. Um, I would use it and see what it looks like in your Busco score maybe, like how yeah. it's being reflected. Yeah, it's something that we're trying to address hopefully within like a week or so. And we've got a couple of potential fixes, but a good benchmark is if you, exactly like Cynthia said, if you are seeing that high uh, Busco duplication rate, wait for that fix to come out. Um, otherwise it performs without that issue in some cases, but I think we know what we need to do. So that's a really good question. And, and that's how I would, that's how I would make that call right now. Yeah, yeah. that seems fair. Um, any other questions on Discord? Yeah, sorry, it's not as free flowing as when people can just raise their hand, but I think I've been burnt now. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually recognize I actually recognize all the names now on the because a few people have dropped off, and I know it's probably safe. But now that it's webinar mode, I don't know how to change it so quickly. 
I love the I love the meme. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We love it there. <laughs> if there are yeah, no we, more questions, oh sorry, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say uh, we'll continue monitoring Discord for questions there. We also shared kind of a longer term Slack link that's available too if if any questions arise, and we'll put any um, updates there, and also share you know any data sets you're you're working with or challenges there. Um, we're in the process of benchmarking easel right now for publication. So we're really interested in anything that you're seeing, anything that you want to see in the tool as well. So we love community feedback. Yes. Very much. Fabulous. Okay. Well, in that case, I will stop now because I think there are no more questions. And thank you very much. And apologies for all previous fiascos. Cheers. No Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.